the three laws of thermodynamics that we hold dear have now been with us for more than a century. The fourth one, also known as the zeroth law, was first formulated in 1935, more than half a century ago. Contemporary physics is a much more detailed subject than it was in those times. Richer in content, mathematical formalism and good enough to give us an amazingly accurate picture of nature. While we do know that we have yet to understand dark matter, neutrinos and some other things to go beyond the standard model, so far the standard model has been stubbornly accurate, refusing to show us the right way through its cracks. The mathematical foundations of quantum field theory aren't as rigorous as they should be, but we're getting satisfying results using perturbation theory and non-perturbative approximations such as lattice QCD. Right next to the standard model we have general relativity marvelously elegant and notoriously difficult calculation-wise, but amazingly accurate at astronomical and cosmological scales. There is a growing trend in physics of unification, not just quantum field theory with general relativity as mathematical theories, but also of our understanding of the universe as a whole with our understanding of the fundamental building blocks of reality. In light of these advances, which opened up many interesting mathematical, physical and philosophical questions, how do our beloved laws of thermodynamics fit in? The first law of thermodynamics was formulated on an empirical basis. Temperature and heat weren't understood and physicists talked of caloric fluids flowing between bodies. Today we understand that heat is simply a name we give to energy in transfer, whereby one body loses energy and the other body gains the same amount of energy. Temperatures change in these processes because temperature is also nothing but a measure of energy, up to a constant. So we see that the first law is completely equivalent to the law of conservation of energy adapted to thermodynamic systems. By Nether's theorem, conservation of energy is a consequence of time translation invariance of isolated physical systems. In classical mechanics, this invariance is a consequence of the homogeneity of time as a linear mapping on the four-dimensional affine space equipped with a Galilean space-time structure. Although there is no generally accepted description of relativistic thermodynamics, let alone a full general relativistic description, the law of conservation of energy still holds true, exactly in special relativity and approximately and under special circumstances in general relativity. The conserved quantity, as a consequence of symmetries of the Einstein-Hilbert action, in this case is the conserved current of energy momentum formed from the stress energy momentum pseudo tensor. Strictly speaking, general relativity leaves open the question of whether there is a conservation of energy for the entire universe. The peculiar nature of dark energy makes things even more difficult, but nevertheless energy is still locally approximately conserved under certain mathematical conditions which are not too restrictive. In quantum field theory, local energy conservation is also ensured, from Poincaré invariance by the quantum version of Noether's theorem for the energy momentum operator. Expanding out to quantum field theory in curved spacetime and quantum gravity, it would only be natural to expect conservation of a quantity which we can experimentally relate to what we call energy, even if only approximately. As we can see, there is no fundamental need for a separate law such as the first law of thermodynamics, because we now know 
that the quantity which it describes is simply a form of energy. The first law still has its uses in engineering and axiomatic thermodynamics, but basically we mainly invoke it because of tradition and as a learning tool. The zeroth law of thermodynamics defines temperature as an equivalence relation on the set of all equilibrated thermodynamics systems. We say the two bodies are in thermal equilibrium if there is no net change of the observable state of the compound system over time. It is obviously reflexive, symmetric and transitive and the equivalence classes form a continuous family, each characterized by a real number we call temperature. If a body A transfers heat to some body B, we assign a larger temperature to the equivalence class of body A and vice versa. Today we know that these equivalence classes, temperatures, are simply a measure of the average kinetic energy of random translational motion of the particles making up a system. We also know that there is a minimal value of temperature, which we call the absolute zero. We also use the Kelvin temperature scale, which relates energy to temperature by a numerical multiplicative constant. Within the framework of statistical mechanics, we obtain temperature as a Lagrange multiplier from the famous relation Ts equals Te over T, which was also derived by Clausius using thermodynamics. Here, the knowledge of systems' statistical properties in equilibrium is assumed and we can view entropy as a purely mathematical property of the probability distribution of microstates for the energies of the system. The Lagrange multiplier inverse temperature arises naturally when we maximize the entropy along with the constraint which defines the total energy and the probability normalization constraint. Although we think of temperature as a statistical property of systems with many degrees of freedom, that is, we think in terms of configuration space ensembles, it is possible to extend the definition of temperature even to systems of few particles. This is accomplished by considering time ensembles assuming ergodicity. When considering relativistic theories, Conventional definitions of temperature usually break down. The difficulties follow, among other reasons, from difficulties with consistently defining energy in special relativity and general relativity, as already mentioned. In cosmology, however, we often speak of the temperature of the universe. This temperature is obtained from astronomical observations of cosmic microwave background radiation. Under the assumption of thermal equilibrium, this background is considered a black body, also known as cavity radiation, and temperature is calculated from its spectrum. Although the zeroth law was introduced after the first three laws in order to establish a consistent axiomatic theory within which temperature is well defined, it is obvious that we do not need such a law today, since, once again, it essentially follows from the conservation of energy combined with probability theory applied to physical systems. The second law of thermodynamics states that the total entropy of the universe is always increasing. It remains constant for reversible systems, but those are highly contrived idealized situations which do not occur in nature. Without doubt, the second law is one of the most important laws in physics and many physicists consider it so important that many tentative theories end up being discarded if they do not allow for it. The quantity described by this law, entropy, has had many phases throughout history. Earliest insights linked entropy with disorder and irreversibility. It was obviously a state variable but its physical content wasn't quite clear before the great success of statistical mechanics. Within it, entropy is simply a logarithmic measure of the number of states with significant probability of being occupied. 
Entropy, however, isn't strictly a physical quantity. It's a mathematical property of a probability distribution. Since statistical physics and information theory are both simply applied probability theory, it might not seem surprising that there is a link between entropy and information, although it took many years for it to become apparent. This link elegantly reveals information as something physical rather than abstract and relates high entropy to small information content and vice versa. Loosely speaking, we might say that entropy gives us a measure of ignorance about the system's microstate having observed its macrostate. We can then interpret the second law as the fact that after a measurement our ignorance cannot decrease with time evolution. One of the long-standing unsolved problems in theoretical physics is closely related to the concept of time evolution. Why does time have a direction, and why is that direction the same as the direction of increasing entropy? Many attempts to prove the second law from first principles have been made, but they all include implicit assumptions which seem obvious, but do not follow from first principles. Usually we consider a coarse-grained phase space and the argument goes like this. If we start from some point in the phase space, it is exceedingly more likely to end up in the region representing the equilibrium state than in any other region, since it is vastly larger than any other region. Since it is always more likely to end up in larger regions, the entropy is exceedingly more likely to increase. But we could have put it the other way around. If we find ourselves at some point in the phase space, by the same argument it is exceedingly more likely that we got there from one of the larger regions, so entropy must have been larger in the past. But that's simply not true. The laws of mechanics are time reversible, CPT invariant to be precise, so are the assumptions in this argument, which tries to derive the second law. The asymmetry wasn't there to begin with. We introduced it by implicitly choosing the direction of time. We tacitly assumed that we got to our starting point from an even smaller region of phase space. And this attempt to prove the second law brings us to the Big Bang. And the question becomes, why did the universe start from such a small region of phase space? Or to phrase it differently, why was the entropy so low at the beginning of time? We don't know. This problem is related to many other problems of a more philosophical nature, such as finding the right interpretation of quantum mechanics. While many physicists dismiss the problem as non-existent, embracing the shut up and calculate Copenhagen interpretation, fortunately some are starting to realize that the question of ontology of quantum mechanics is very important, not just because some philosophers have to get their paychecks, but because a good ontology might be a great guide to unification of physical theories. It is not clear how that could be done by ignoring the problem completely and embracing the far-fetched and definitely ill-defined Copenhagen interpretation, which has survived through history mostly because of authoritative power of its supporters. Among the leading theoretical physicists, one interpretation has lately found strong support because of its elegance and explanatory power. It is the Everettian view of many worlds, which only postulates the Schrödinger equation, and it doesn't artificially introduce processes of measurement which discontinuously collapse wave functions. In this interpretation, there is only the universal wave function and its unitary evolution. At each instance of physical interactions, the wave function, so to speak, branches into every physically allowable outcome. Microscopic objects are viewed as processes, patterns, as opposed to concrete things.
Mathematical formalism suggests that all these universes occupy the same space-time as we do, but different branches of the wave function cannot interact with other members of the universal Hilbert space. Quantum interference happens when two branches, so to speak, merge, that is, when there is a point in the evolution in which they are in the same state. This requires all information of the earlier branching to be lost, so no paradoxes, including observers, can arise. This brings us to entropy and the second law within the Everettian framework. Physical interactions involve an exchange of information. A system doesn't have to be a conscious observer in order to gain information about some other system. We don't usually call it knowledge, we call it correlation. After all, the knowledge that we have in our brains is also simply a physical correlation between the states of our neurons and the physical world. That idea certainly brings us closer to the interpretation of the second law as a statement regarding ignorance. We could imagine non-correlation as ignorance and pick up from there, but let's avoid these ideas that might seem too far-fetched. And let us consider a human observer called Bob. Assuming Bob is familiar with the Everettian view of quantum mechanics, Bob considers himself as a member of an ensemble consisting of all other Bobs in all other branches of the universal wave function. When performing a measurement, every possible outcome happens and each Bob feels that the outcome was completely random. Knowing the relative state with respect to the environment of a system at that particular time, Bob waits and lets it evolve unitarily within the environment. It's not hard to see that Bob loses information about the system as time passes, because interactions continue to happen, wave function continues to branch, and Bob cannot know a priori in which of the branches he will end up. So it seems natural that the entropy should go up for almost all Bobs. It is somewhat harder to realize this mathematically, but one can show that the entropy necessarily comes into equations when calculating the number of branching universes. This kind of argument could also have been used in the classical sense without invoking the Everettian interpretation, simply by assuming a finite resolution of classical measurements. By Liouville's theorem, the volume of the phase space occupied by the system points is constant, but its shape continuously changes. We can only notice those changes which are detectable by our instruments, so the apparent volume of the phase space occupied by states allowed by our instruments must increase, thereby increasing the entropy. It is also worth mentioning that the second law of thermodynamics and the problem of measurement in quantum mechanics are both closely linked to another philosophical problem, the problem of interpretations of probability theory. Conventional frequentist views don't stand up to a more rigorous investigation and intrinsic probability seems to be a very awkward property that begs an explanation. On the other hand, Bayesian probability seems perfectly compatible with the Everettian view, although it is not perfectly clear how prior probabilities should be acquired in a universe without any objective probabilities, whatever that means. All in all, the second law continues to be extremely important and baffling, especially because of its possible connections to other equally important unsolved problems. Last but not least, there is the third law of thermodynamics, which states that the entropy of a perfect crystal at absolute zero is exactly equal to zero. The physical content of this law is best described by the fact that it is impossible to bring a system to the absolute zero of temperature in a finite number of steps.
The conventional way of showing this is to show that the heat capacities of systems cannot be constant, they are always temperature dependent at sufficiently low temperatures. Basically, the third law states that the entropy of a system at absolute zero is a well-defined constant. Today we have quantum mechanics and we understand that a perfect crystal must have a non-degenerate ground state. Since the ground state is the state of lowest energy, it will be the state of the system at the absolute zero. It is the only possible state at that temperature, which means that the number of microstates corresponding to that macrostate is exactly one. So the entropy, its logarithm, must be exactly zero. From a modern point of view, this law is obviously not a fundamental one. It is an almost trivial consequence of statistical mechanics and quantum theory. In conclusion, it is manifest that the laws of thermodynamics are actual laws only from the perspective of someone playing around with axiomatic thermodynamics or applying thermodynamics. But they no longer have the same importance with regards to actual nature as they used to have. These laws, with the second law being an exception, are now either seen as a specific version of some broader principle or as consequence of main postulates of modern physical theories. They are still taught in undergraduate courses because of their historical importance, but I think that educators should more often point out that not all of these are fundamental laws of nature. Also, while I believe that thermodynamics might not be a bad introduction to the subject, I would much prefer if the course of statistical physics started with probability theory and actual statistical physics, and if thermodynamical laws were shown as a consequence of a more fundamental laws, not the other way around. The second law is obviously still very very interesting and important at this stage. And we have no reason to believe that someday it will be discarded. We can only hope that we will succeed at unifying physics and finding the appropriate ontology for our fundamental theories. Nobody can tell where our pursuit of understanding of the second law might lead us. Perhaps we will see it in a completely different light, which will illuminate our way. Who knows? So far, it just keeps getting more and more interesting with each new generation of physicists.